Hi everyone. This lecture is on heart sounds, and this lecture is actually uh, part of the same lecture, which is the heart sounds and valvular disorders lecture. So when you're done looking at this video, I would follow it up with the valvular disorder lecture as well. So to start, just a little bit of history, which I thought was interesting. You have here in this painting uh, a gentleman by the name of René Lenec, and uh, he was a, a, phys a physician who worked in the uh, 1800s, early 1800s. And as you can see, he's listening to this patient with his, uh, his ear against the chest. And that was a fairly common practice where they would, you know, they would, they would palpate, um, you know, they put their hands on the person's chest. Um, and they would also auscultate by putting their ear against the chest to listen for certain sounds. And auscultation is very, very useful as part of our, our uh, physical, um, uh, physical exam workup where we can hear different things in the GI system, the lungs, the heart. And uh, <clears throat> in this particular case, uh, he actually, as the story goes, uh, he was working with a patient who was a, a, a woman who had a very large body habitus. And um, he would not be able to actually auscultate her effectively. And given the fact that she was female, he would not be, you know, per it would not be permissible for him to actually put his, his ear against her chest. And so he actually had fashioned uh, a, a piece of paper and rolled it up and used it as a tube to distance himself. And he was able to actually amplify the sounds of the heart better than, his, than if he actually just put his ear to his chest. Uh, so really that was sort of the, the invention of the early stethoscope, which is really, really rolled up piece of paper. Ultimately, he, he turned it into a, he, he fashioned, I should say, a wooden tube as he used to make wooden flutes and it was able to amplify sounds in that manner. And so that was our early stethoscope, not like the stethoscopes that we use uh, today, but uh, that was the inspiration for what we're using now. So auscultation, as I mentioned, it's listening to the sounds that are made by the body, okay? And understand that when uh, doing an, a physical exam, it, depending on you know, the, the situation that you're in. If you're in a more of an emergency situation, an acute setting, you might not be able to do the full and complete exam, as I've kind of mentioned in the previous uh, video that I've, I've given. Uh, so you may have to do parts of this, given the scenario. However, if you have the time, then you should do the exam in the appropriate manner and to the fullest extent possible. So in order to do that, if we're, let's say, working in a cardiology office and we have time to work with this patient, we should be listening to them as the, or listening to their heart uh, as they're supine or laid back. Uh, something called the left lateral decubitus position, which is they'll be rolled onto their left side. That actually helps us to hear certain types of heart sounds. Um, it should be upright, so you can have them sit upright. Upright as well as leaning forward uh, will, will help actually uh, with certain heart sounds as well. And then inhaling and exhaling. So we have to pay attention to their breathing, okay? Uh, so these are all uh, various maneuvers we can give the patient to to make sure that we hear uh, the heart sounds in all the, the best positions possible. Now, in addition to that part of the exam, we would obviously have palpation as well. And this is where you, you know, you'd actually put your hand on the, on the person's chest and you could either feel a thrill and a thrill is vibration. You're feeling a vibration on the person's chest and that can actually happen with something we call a murmur. And we'll talk about what murmurs are in a little bit, okay? And then there could also be something called a lift. And a lift is, a, is a something you'd feel like the chest actually raising uh, as the heart's contracting. And this is, you know, this could be parasternal, in the parasternal area, typically to the sort of the left sternal um, area. And that might be indicative of something like right uh, ventricular hypertrophy, since the right ventricle is actually most anterior in the chest normally. And so if it enlarges, it would be pushed up against the chest there and you might actually feel a lift on the person's chest. So this, this is all part of you know, our assessment of the patient that would give us information. Obviously, we would include imaging and other workup uh, to be certain and help us with our diagnosis, but this is sort of the art of the physical exam and, and being able to figure out what's going on with the patient prior to giving any other uh, type of testing. Um, another thing to keep in mind, when it comes to uh, you know listening to heart sounds, okay, we want to make sure that we have as little material between uh, the stethoscope and the chest wall, 
because any sounds can occur in between then. So for example, if you listen over somebody's shirt, which is how, you know, unfortunately how it can be done often, uh, the shirt makes its own sounds. And when the person is breathing or not, okay, the shirt can move. And as you're moving the stethoscope, that can create sounds that could obscure heart sounds. So if you're doing a full examination, you should be sure that you're listening on the chest wall, which would mean that you'd have to ask the patient to move clothing out of the way, or if it's female, if they're wearing a bra, that may have to be moved, uh, because you really need to make sure that you are listening clearly. Okay, when you're auscultating, all right, though so the sounds you're gonna hear, the classic sounds, the normal physiology should be really two sounds that we note as an S1, and an S2, so the sound, the sound one and sound two. Now, when we're hearing that, that's our classic lub dub, lub dub. These are high pitched sounds that the valves in the heart are making. Okay. Now remember, the valves are simply mechanical and they shut based on pressure differences. In other words, let's say we're talking about the right ventricle. As the right ventricle starts to contract and it wants to eject blood into the pulmonary circulation. Uh, it doesn't want backflow into the right atrium. So as the pressure increases as the ventricle is contracting, that's going to cause the uh, tricuspid valve to close. Okay, it's going to snap shut. All right, and that's simply due to the increasing pressure. Okay, so it acts as a one-way valve, and when that valve slams shut, you hear a sound. And in fact, the tricuspid as well as the mitral valve, since the left side of the and the right side of the heart effectively um, are stimulated simultaneously, they'll usually shut simultaneously. So for example, uh, the S1 sound is both the mitral valve as well as the tricuspid valve shutting. So it happens simultaneously, so we hear one sound typically. Okay. Now, uh, S2, S2 is the closing of the pulmonic and the aortic valve. So let's take a look at this over here. This is the Wiggers diagram over here, here, okay, to the left. And what I want to draw your attention to here is the timing. So let me, a good color to work with here. All right, so if we follow the blue tracing at the top here, now note that this is a pressure tracing. So imagine we take a catheter and we insert that catheter into the left ventricle, for example. All right, and that catheter is going to measure pressure in millimeters of mercury, and so we can record that. So, note at the bottom here, okay, on this axis here, this is systole and diastole. And just as a reminder, systole is when the heart is contracting, and diastole is when it is relaxing. Oftentimes, we're usually using systole or diastole in reference to the ventricle, okay? So, that's what these are referring to is systole and diastole of the ventricle. Now this blue tracing, this blue pressure tracing over here, that is in the left ventricle. So you'll note, I'm going to start over here. I'm just going to draw it in red next to it. In fact, you know what, let me change it to green, which is a color that's not being used on that. But here, you'll notice that this pressure over here in this segment, this is during diastole. And you'll notice the pressures are fairly low, somewhere between 0 and 10 millimeters of mercury. And then at this point right here, all right, you'll notice that suddenly the pressure starts to rise. The reason the pressure rises is because the ventricle is contracting. So it's increasing the pressure inside the ventricle at that time. So this is during systole over here. Okay, so that's during ventricular systole. You notice the pressure goes all the way up and peaks and then it comes right back down again. All right, it comes right back down. And then we're back in diastole where we have our low pressures again so it can fill up with blood and then repeats again over here. As it contracts, the pressures go up again. And that's all that's showing you right there. But there's a couple of other details to take note of. At this point here, which I circled, end of diastole, start of systole, when it's starting to contract. As the ventricle contracts and builds pressure, it shuts the one-way valve. It shuts the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve. Right now, this is only looking at the left side of the heart. It would be the same on the right side of the heart, but the pressures would be different since the right side of the heart has much lower pressures. But right now, we're only looking at left ventricle. So what you see here is at that point, at the end of diastole and the start of systole, the mitral valve closes quickly. And that creates a sound. That's the S1 sound. In fact, if we take a look down here, this is called a phonocardiogram, which is giving you the recording of the sound. 
This is a high-pitched sound when it closes. It causes a vibration, which is a high pitch that we hear with our stethoscope. So here you see is our first heart sound, our S1. That's the closing of the mitral valve and the tricuspid as well. So they would be closing simultaneously. And then over here at this point, as the ventricle is contracting, none of the volume is being ejected yet because the aortic valve is still closed. This red tracing here represents pressure in the aorta. So it has to overcome a certain pressure in the aorta. And then suddenly the valve opens, right? The aortic valve opens, blood is ejected, but as it relaxes. Now understand, when the aortic valve opens, there is no sound. Okay, that doesn't produce a sound. However, here when it's relaxing at this point, when it's relaxing, the pressure inside the ventricle drops below the pressure in the aorta, so blood wants to go backwards into the ventricle. But it can't because we have a one-way valve there. That's our aortic valve. Or if it's on the right side of the heart, it's the pulmonic valve. And they will slam shut. That creates a high-pitched sound. So at that point, if you look at that, what that coincides with is the second heart sound. So that's our lub and our dup. Lub is the first heart sound, and our dup is the second heart sound. Okay? So the second heart sound, the S2, is the aortic and the pulmonic valve. Then, of course, the ventricle relaxes, fills up with blood, and we repeat the process. You might have noticed, if you've been paying attention here, is that during diastole, diastole, first off, is longer than systole. And that at point A right here, you'll know that, you notice that the diastolic pressure goes up a little bit, and that's because the atria, at the very end of ventricular diastole, they will contract to eject a little bit more blood into the ventricle before the ventricle contracts. So that's why we see a little pressure rise there, okay? Now, when we listen, okay, we listen uh, classically to the sort of four regions uh, on the chest, on the chest wall, and we use the stethoscope, okay? Most of us can have a stethoscope that looks something like this. It has two sides to it, okay? Now, when you look here, this part here, the, the, the wider part right here, that is called the diaphragm. The diaphragm is primarily what we use, and it, it can pick up high-pitched sounds. So the S1 and the S2, you'd pick up with your diaphragm, all right, or anything else that's high-pitched, murmurs that are high-pitched, for example. The other side of the stethoscope, okay, that's called the bell, all right? Now, with the bell, you can pick up low-pitched sounds, and there'll be certain murmurs, for example, that are low-pitched and certain heart sounds that will be low-pitched, and you can hear that better with the bell. So when you're examining patient, you're going to use both sides, okay? Now, a couple other things about this is, uh, you know, when you're using these, in order to switch, in many cases, you can actually just turn the head and you'll hear a click, and it switches from one to the other. Not all stethoscopes are created the same. You have to make sure you understand how to use yours before seeing the patient, of course. Uh, and oftentimes with the bell, with the low pitch sounds, you have to hold it gently on onto the onto the body. All right, you don't want to press too hard. Okay, so now the uh, the, the areas we listen to are the what we call the aortic region. So if you look here in blue, all right. So here is where we're listening for the aortic valve. Understand when we listen to any one of these areas, we can hear any of the valves in any of those areas. But this is where we would hear the, uh, the aortic valve the best or the clearest or even the loudest, for instance. We might be best at, the, um, at that spot. And what that spot is, it's the right side of the sternum in the second intercostal space. Okay, so I'm just going to write a little A here. All right, so that's the A for the aortic region. And then over here, we're listening on the left side of the sternum in the second intercostal space. All right, and that's going to be listening to the pulmonic, all right, the pulmonic valve. Then down here in the fifth intercostal space on the left side is the tricuspid. And then this over here is the mitral. And so that space with the mitral valve, that's at the apex of the heart. And that's usually going to be somewhere near the, the mid-clavicular line. So if we look at the clavicle, somewhere in the, the middle of the clavicle, it lines up approximately with the, the mid-clavicular -clav uh, region in the fifth intercostal space. Now, as you guys are going to learn in other, other classes when you're doing the actual hands-on process, um, you know, trying to find the second intercostal space, you have to palpate, okay? Uh, you can actually feel the sternal angle. That can actually be a landmark. If you feel for the sternal angle, 
All right, that's actually where the second rib here makes contact with the sternum. So if you're having difficulty finding or locating the region that's the second intercostal space, find that sternal angle or otherwise known as the angle of Louis. And then that's, you go across that, you can feel the second rib go down and you're in the second intercostal space, okay? So you can palpate those regions to make sure that you have the right area that you're listening to and you're listening most effectively. Uh, so again, you know, you'll have your own pattern, start in the right, go to the left and then down and then, and then over. Uh, another way to remember this is, you know, you can have what we call apartment M, as I remembered it, uh, from medical school. So apartment M, so that's aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral, as you follow it from the right side of the sternum over. But whatever works for you guys. And um, so, if we look carefully at this, all right, you'll notice that the aortic and pulmonic, you hear best at the base of the heart okay and then the tricuspid and the mitral are heard better towards the apex of the heart and it has to do a lot with the directionality of the flow and so on and that's what the uh that's what it's kind of showing you there with those bars okay so these are to be the regions that you hear those best all right now one of the biggest things you need to do when listening to the heart and one of the things that can be hardest for most people in, in the beginning is being able to figure out the s1 from the s2 Okay, so that can be one of the, the biggest challenges. Um, now, again, the, S, the S1 and the S2 come close together because S1 to S2, that's usually a shorter duration, okay, because systole is shorter than diastole. So S2 to the next S1 has a little bit longer of a pause. So sometimes from the rhythm, we can figure out S1 from S2. But if you're having trouble, especially if the person's heart rate's a little bit higher, uh, what you can do is you can actually palpate the carotids. Now understand with the carotid, you want to you want to auscultate carotids first and foremost, especially in elderly, because they could have plaques there and we don't want to dislodge anything like that. So you'd auscultate, make sure it's clear. Uh, then you can actually feel the, car uh, the carotid, okay? And then listen to the heart at the same time. And what happens is when you feel that pulse of the carotid, the sound you're going to hear almost simultaneously with that is the S1. Because remember, when the ventricle contracts and it ejects blood into the carotid, you will feel an upward pulse. As the ventricle is contracting, creating that pulse, the AV valve or the tricuspid or mitral valves are closing. So when you feel that pulse and you hear the sound, the S1 is going to correspond with that. I would steer clear from uh, feeling the radial pulse. Okay, the radial pulse is, is a good bit further away from the heart and the timing of it could be a little off. So do it with the carotid if you're gonna do it that way. Okay. Okay, so I've kind of alluded to this on the, in an earlier slide, but we have an S1 and an S2, and I said that the S1s happen simultaneously, and for the most part, um, that's, that's usually gonna hold true. You're gonna, the S1s are always gonna be fairly simultaneous. However, um, the aortic and pulmonic valve, which create the S2 sound, under normal conditions can actually create what we call a split sound, where they separate the timing of their closure is a little bit different from each other. And so this is important to understand because there's certain disorders where the split can be, um, you know, a diagnostic for us. Now, if we take a look at this top box right here, okay, this is normal. So your, your S2 normally splits, all right? So it's showing you over here in S1 and the S1, it's showing you what's happening during inspiration and expiration, okay? When you breathe in and breathe out normally, the S1 doesn't change. Okay. However, when you're breathing in or breathing out, the S2 can change. And then A, so we call the S2, we break it up into uh, A2 and P2. So A2 and P2, what this means is the A is for aortic and P is for pulmonic. It's just what they represent for the second heart sound. And so that's what you're seeing over here, A2 versus P2. All right. Now you'll notice that during inspiration, there's a separation of the A2 and P2, but during expiration, they're together. What this means is when the person is breathing out, as they breathe out, the heart sounds, S1 and S2, both sound like a single S1 and a single S2, because the A2 and the P2 overlap with each other. They're basically occurring simultaneously. When you breathe in, on the other hand, as you breathe in, what you hear is a single S1, but then the S2, you hear two S2s, and they occur very quickly together. It's like a but, but, 
it happens very quickly. They call that second heart sound when it splits. Right? They call it a split S2, and it's normal when they breathe in. Okay. What's happening here? The reason for that split is as the patient or as anybody breathes in, they decrease intrathoracic pressure as the lungs expand and the thorax uh, expands. The pressure drops, and so that increases the amount of blood returning to the heart. Okay. So it creates a, a bigger uh, pressure gradient for the blood to flow. And so there's an increase in blood flow to the right side of the heart. So into the right atrium and the right ventricle. So the right side of the heart sees a higher volume of blood while you breathe in. Now when you breathe in, your lungs expand. So that also explain, expands all the blood vessels within the, uh, within the lungs as well. And so it expands them and also reduces uh, their resistance a little bit and increases what we call their capacitance, so their ability to even hold blood. So their volume of blood they can hold on to can go up, okay? Because they're being expanded just by the physical act of the lung tissue expanding them, all right? So it can hold on to more blood. What that, what that means is because it can act as like a larger reservoir of blood during inspiration, it holds on to more blood. So therefore the left side of the heart sees less volume. In other words, when you breathe in, you have an increase in volume to the right side of the heart and a decrease in blood volume to the left side of the heart. When you breathe out, this is reversed. You have a decrease in the right side and an increase on the left side. This is an important physiology, okay? Now, how does this pertain to the heart sound splitting? Well, what happens is when you breathe in and you increase volume to the right side of the heart and the lungs expand and increase their capacity, that lowers the resistance, which means it lowers the back pressure uh, to shut the pulmonic valve. So it delays the amount of time, or it increases the amount of time it takes for there to be enough back pressure to shut the pulmonic valve. The aortic valve really doesn't change in terms of when it shuts, but the pulmonic valve is uh, does change because that drastically changes the hemodynamics within the vasculature of the lungs. So it delays the shutting time of the pulmonic valve. So when it, what happens is the aortic shuts before the pulmonic does during inspiration. So you hear a split S2. Now you can really kind of amplify this by having somebody, let's say, exercise. You can have a young, healthy person exercise. And uh, you might actually, because of taking deeper breaths, you might be able to hear the, the split a little bit better. Now with the splits, all right, um, we have really three conditions uh, where it's actually abnormal, abnormal types of splitting, all right? So I've listed them over here as widened splitting fixed splitting, and paradoxical splitting. And that gives us information about certain types of causes, which I listed over here. All right, so it's the same kind of format, expiration versus inspiration. Here's your S1s and your A2 and your P2s, okay? Now let's start with widened splitting. Widened splitting, if you take a look during inspiration and expiration, all right, there's a split here and there's a split here. So there's a split both during inspiration and expiration. Right off the bat, that's abnormal. Okay, so we know something's going on there. Now what you'll notice if you're listening very, very carefully, and if you look at this little cartoon here, you'll notice that during expiration, the split is not as wide as it is during inspiration. So we call it a widened split. They're splitting in both circumstances, but one's a little wider than the other. Okay, what causes this? Well, over here we said right bundle branch block, and pulmonary stenosis. They have something in common. What this is, is it delays the right side of the heart. Okay, so as an example, a right bundle branch block, all right, this would be uh, blocking conduction to the right ventricle. And so it conducts to the left ventricle first because the left bundle branch is not blocked. So the left ventricle uh, receives electrical impulse first and it's able to Go, go about its normal activity and shut the aortic valve and its normal amount of time. However, when that electrical uh, impulse goes to the left side of the heart, it now has to travel through the myocytes, which is slower, to the right side of the heart. And then the right side of the heart is going to uh, contract. But now it's a little bit behind. Now that's a permanent damage or a permanent uh, abnormality. So it's delayed whether you breathe in or breathe out. Okay, you're going to have that delay simply because the conduction time takes longer regardless of whether you're breathing in or breathing out. Okay, it just so happens that the delay would be a little bit more during inspiration as well because you already have a delay and now you're breathing in so it further delays it. So that's why we have a widened uh, split. Pulmonary stenosis, 
This is, you know, blocking the outflow of blood from the right side of the heart or right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation. And so it takes more time for it to do the, the full ejection. And again, that's more of a fixture, an anatomical fixture. So it's going to happen regardless of inspiration or expiration. Now, fixed splitting, which is the one uh, next. All right. Now, during fixed split, you'll notice that it's splitting both in expiration and inspiration, just like widened splitting. But with fixed splitting, the difference between A2 and P2 is the same regardless of breathing in or out. It doesn't change. So it's not widening during inspiration here. It's exactly the same. And this is classically associated with atrial septal defect, something I like to ask on a lot of standardized exams, actually. So it's classically a sign of the uh, atrial septal defect. Now, what they mean by an atrial septal defect is that there is communication between the left atrium and the right atrium. And keep in mind that the left side of the heart has higher pressures than the right side of the heart under normal circumstances. And so the left side, if there's an opening directly into the right side of the heart, which is a lower pressure, blood is going to move from the left side of the heart into the right side of the heart. Which means that the left side of the heart, since it usually has higher pressures, okay, is going to be shunting blood from the left into the right atrium. It's going to volume overload the right side. Um, and during expiration, it's going to keep it volume overloaded just because it's going to be shunting from left to right. And when they breathe in, it's going to return a higher volume to the right side of the heart. That higher volume coming from the right side of the heart while they're inspiring is going to offset, proportionally offset, the amount of blood that would be coming from the left side of the heart. So there's not as much blood coming from the left side of the heart during inspiration. All right. Um, and so they offset each other and you end up with what we call a fixed split. All right. And so this fixed splitting is, you know, indicative of something like an atrial septal defect. And then the last one here is paradoxical. And in the paradoxical splitting, this is, as it sounds, what you have is you have a split during expiration and no splitting during inspiration. It's the exact opposite of what you'd find under normal physiological conditions. So, uh, you know, obviously that should raise a red flag uh, right off the first, you know, off the uh, right off the cuff there. And you can see here, the A2 and P2 is split during expiration. So what could cause that? Well, this is really the flip side of what you're seeing with the widened splitting. Remember, widened splitting, it's right bundle branch block or pulmonary stenosis. With a paradoxical splitting, it's left bundle branch block or aortic stenosis. So, so again, why is it paradoxical though? Why isn't just both of them split, you know, just like we saw? Well, the reason is this, okay? Uh, the aortic valve is being delayed both during expiration and inspiration, all right? It's, it's delayed in both cases. So if you have a left, left bundle branch block, you have a delayed electrical impulse to the left side of the heart. It has to travel from the right side. So the right side will be able to contract first and then sends the impulse towards the, towards the left. So the left is a little bit more delayed. And so if we're expiring, you'll notice that the pulmonic valve can close first and then the aortic valve will close because it's delayed. Now, if you're breathing in, the aortic valve is still delayed. However, as you breathe in, it's the normal mechanics of slowing down the uh, pulmonic closure due to an increase in volume and so on. So the pulmonic valve is undergoing its normal delay and the aortic valve is already delayed. And what happens is the aortic valve delay and the pulmonic valve delayed from inspiration, which it normally does, is actually going to overlap with the aortic valve, uh, the, the abnormal aortic valve delay. And so they come together and it sounds like one. And so this is what we call paradoxical splitting. Okay, there's also something referred to as extra heart sounds. So we have an S1 and S2, which is what we're normally listening for. Uh, we have to figure out which one's the S1 and which one's the S2 because there's a really important feature, which is understanding when the person's in systole and when they're in diastole. In the cartoon here, you see this yellow bar all right, here and here, and that's between the S1 and S2. So this is one and this is two. Between S1 and S2, that's when the ventricles are in systole. And then between S2 and the next S1 is diastole. And usually the time in diastole, at least at rest, uh, is longer than the time in systole, all right? And so we have our normal S1 and S2, but we can have extra sounds, okay? So these sounds, could be if it's in the systolic, if it's happening during systole between S1 and S2, you could have something called an ejection click. 
All right, we call them clicks during systole. And what this means is that you know we either have aortic or pulmonic stenosis, where this is a rigid valve that doesn't open as well. All right, so it's more of an obstruction, so to speak. And so when you have the stenosis, to open it up, sometimes those rigid valves, which, which can be calcified or what up, what have you, they're rigid and they, they make a clicking sound uh, when you're trying to force them open. And so we call that an ejection click. Now the timing of that click can give us an indication of the severity of it and so on, which we can get into later. But for example, I have mid-late clicks. Uh, they can occur with something called a mitral or tricuspid valve prolapse. So it's happening during systole. It's causing the mitral or the tricuspid valve to prolapse or kind of billow into the atria. And that can also cause a clicking sound. In diastole, some of the extra sounds that you could hear are what we call an opening snap. So not a click, but a snap. And the snap has to do with mitral valve or tricuspid valve stenosis. So this is opening up uh, you know, a, a more rigid uh, tricuspid valve or mitral valve, and it creates what we call a snapping sound. As well, in, in diastole, you can also hear an S3 and an S4. So an S3 and an S4. So you can see that on our cartoon over here. Here's the fourth heart sound. You can see the third heart sound. Okay, here's our other fourth, and here's another third over here. So an S3 and S4, these are high-pitched sounds that occur during diastole. S3s occur in early diastole and are indicative of... Uh, rapid expansion of a very dilated ventricle, so a large chamber. So it's kind of like blood sloshing into a large uh, ventricle. And this is a low pitch sound. So you would be listening to this with the, uh, with the bell. Okay. So it's a low pitch sound. The S4 occurs in late uh, diastole. And so you see by late, the S4 over here is happening right before ventricular systole. It coincides with atrial contraction. So when the atria contract and it pushes blood into a rigid, okay, when it pushes blood into a rigid ventricle, and you can have a rigid ventricle from hypertrophy, and we'll go over some examples later, but it goes into a rigid ventricle, uh, it can create another low pitch sound, and it occurs late in diastole. And sometimes commonly the S3 and the S4 are referred to as a gallop sound when you're listening to them, and uh, which actually, uh, it just reminds me that you know you guys um, you should go online and actually you can Google you know um, you know practice auscultation of heart sounds and so on and you get a, a bunch of very good websites that let you practice and hear the sounds of you know some of these extra heart sounds and so on and murmurs that I'm going to talk about and so uh, with a gallop sound you know you hear the regular loved up you know you got your your, your normal beat but then you have an extra one so it's like a but up but but up, but up, but up, but up, and that but up, but up sounds like a galloping sound, and so they call that a, a, a gallop. A murmur. So when we talk about murmurs, uh, what we're really uh, referring to here is not the sound or the closure of uh, the the valves per se. Uh, this the murmurs occur because of turbulent blood flow, and there are many there are different things that can cause turbulent blood flow. So for instance, the viscosity of the blood. Uh, the less viscous it is, you know, the more it can be turbulent. Um, the velocity of the blood flow, an increase in velocity causes, uh, you know, an increase in, in, in turbulence. Uh, and, and volume in general can cause more, more turbulence. But if you have an increase in, in velocity of blood flow going through um, one of the valves, even if the valve is normal, you can cause turbulence. In fact, you could have a healthy individual who, if they're vigorously exercising, you might start to hear a murmur. Uh, as blood is rushing through those valves and they're totally healthy valves it's just the increase in velocity causes a murmur okay and causes turbulence essentially is what we're, what we're hearing is turbulent blood flow keep in mind that under normal circumstances normal resting circumstances we shouldn't have turbulence it should be what we call laminar blood flow or smooth blood flow so okay so we hear turbulent blood flow that creates a murmur and uh, this can happen going through valves uh, you can hear the sort of turbulent uh, blood flow going past a stenotic blood vessel. Okay, you could you could listen for that. We call it a brewy, which you can hear in the carotids. So when it comes to a murmur, we need to be able to describe what we're hearing. So the first step is knowing your S1 and your S2, so you know when systole is occurring and diastole is occurring. So that's what I mean by this first one is timing. 
is it a, is the murmur occurring during systole or diastole? All right. Uh, what is the intensity? So the intensity, if you look over here, is, is scaled here. Now this is looking at uh, systole. We grade that on a one through six. So if you're hearing the murmur during systole, so it's a one out of six, and it increases in intensity from one up to six. So obviously one a one out of six is very faint. And if you look over here at three to six, it's loud, and we're saying that there's no thrill heard here, right? So over here we're looking at thrill. There's no thrill from one up to three out of six, meaning when you palpate, you don't feel a vibration on the person's chest. However, once you get to four out of six, you'll notice that there is a thrill. So that's sort of a change in designation. Once we get to four out of six, they'll all have a thrill from four, five, and six. And so you can hear them. You'll notice that uh, five out of six, you can hear it with the stethoscope partially off the chest, so it's very loud. And then heard with the stethoscope completely off the chest. So that six out of six would be the loudest, or it'd be the most intense, if you will. If we're discussing diastolic murmurs, uh, we would grade it one out of four. Um, <clears throat> The intensity, excuse me, the, the pitch. So that's describing this high pitch or low pitch, which I've kind of already talked about a little bit. Um, S1 and S2 are always high pitch. Most of the murmurs we're going to hear are high pitch, but some of the ones that I mentioned so far that would have been low pitch are an S3 and an S4 are low pitch. Okay. The shape. The shape of it, what we're really talking about is how does the, um, the amplitudes change? when you're hearing it and it create a sort of a shape. And I have on the next slide, we'll, we'll show you what those shapes look like. Um, but if we had the phonocardiogram, it gives you an idea of what the shape looks like. So you can have a crescendoing pattern where it's building up in sound and then a decrescendo where it's dropping. It. Um, and so that's sort of intensity change. All right, can give us a shape. So we'll call that like a diamond shape or a crescendo, decrescendo. Uh, or just a deep crescendo and so on. So I'll show you some examples of that on the next slide. Location. The location is, you know, did you hear it in the aortic area best, pulmonic, tricuspid, and so on. Radiation has to do with, do you hear it anywhere else? So when you take the stethoscope, and let's say I, I've heard, I hear it in one part of the chest, I'm going to move the stethoscope to different parts of the body to see if I can hear it in those regions because that's going to actually give me an idea of what valve might be involved. Um, so for you know, I have an example at the bottom, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then it's response to a maneuver. So these are going to be dynamic maneuvers, which I have a separate slide for you guys, uh, where you're making the patient or you're doing something to the patient to see if you can change how the murmur sounds by lessening it or increasing it by doing certain maneuvers with them. So I'll give you guys an example of how you might see it written up uh, in, say, one of the reports. So you have a grade three out of six high-pitched crescendo, decrescendo, systolic murmur, loudest at the upper sternal border with radiation into the carotids. So if you want, you can try just pause it now and try to see if you can figure out what valve is involved just from that information alone. You should be able to figure that out, um, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into the details of that. All right, so give a little pause just in case you guys wanted to, but this would have to do with the aortic valve, okay? Now, why is it a crescendo, decrescendo? Let's discuss that actually in this slide. So here, um, this is actually giving you some of the shapes. So you can actually see, if we take a look, here's the S1 and the S2. So this is occurring during systole. Here's the S2 and the next S1, so this is during diastole. So these are the murmurs that are occurring at those different times. So if we take a look at the systolic murmur, all right, you have the crescendo, decrescendo. It looks like a diamond shape to it, all right, where it goes up in sound, all right, in amplitude, and then drops again, where it's like a whoosh, whoosh. I apologize for my sound making. It is terrible, but uh, just to kind of give you the idea, but definitely look this up online so you can hear it for yourself. But there's a crescendo to it and then a decrescendo. So the examples for this, aortic stenosis, pulmonic stenosis. So during systole, if you hear a crescendo, it's crescendoing as it's trying to generate enough force to get it past a narrow or stiffened valve. So it's jetting it into through this little uh, opening and it creates a crescendo as the pressure in the ventricle is contracting more and more. The sound goes up, up and up. So it crescendos initially. And then as the ventricle starts to relax, it decrescendos. So you hear a crescendo, decrescendo for aortic or pulmonic stenosis. Okay. <clears throat> Now with the aortic stenosis, 
uh, you can actually hear that in the carotid. So if you listen to the carotid, you can actually hear the murmur there too as well. Uh, so that helps us to kind of separate it out for something, let's say, like pulmonary stenosis. Now, the pan-systolic, otherwise known as holosystolic, all right, we're in S, between our S1 and S2, you notice that the shape of it is the same. It goes across the same intensity, like just a whoosh, whoosh. There's no increase or decrease to it. So um, this is found typically with mitral regurge, tricuspid regurge, or a, vent, a ventricular septal defect. The ventricular septal defect has to do with communication between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And again, the left ventricle is a higher pressure, so it's going to force blood into the right side um, under normal circumstances. Now, the mitral regurge, that's blood going backwards from the left ventricle into the left atrium. We either sometimes refer to it as regurgitation or insufficiency. Tricuspid regurge is the same. It's the right ventricle uh, pushing blood back into the uh, right atrium. Now, as it starts to, as the ventricle starts to contract, it blows it back into the left atrium or uh, the uh, right atrium, and that creates just a holosystolic murmur because this is not a stenotic valve. This is a valve that's just flopping backwards into the uh, atria where it should be closing and shutting. Instead, it's opening up directly and allowing it to go directly back into the atria. So it creates this loud whooshing sound. Um, so for example, with the mitral regurge, you could actually hear some of the, uh, some of the radiation into the left uh, axillary region. Now in late systolic, so this last example here, you have a click. So there's an ejection click. And then you see that there's a holosystolic murmur that follows it, which means you have some sort of insufficiency or regurgitation. So this can happen with mitral valve prolapse, where prolapse means it's bulging back into the left atrium, for example. And it's, it's bulging back, and in many cases, uh, it may not actually have any regurgitation at all. You'll just hear a click. But you could have, well, a lot of them are actually associated with a regurg. So it can click, and then it's regurging as well. So you can see that late there. In a diastolic, so diastolic, we're going from S2 to S1. So what's happening is that S2, if you see this, this pattern is a decrescendo pattern, okay? You'll notice that it's immediately following the S2. So this is classic of an aortic or pulmonic regurge. Remember, that should be shutting to prevent backflow from the lungs or backflow from the uh, aorta. If there's regurge, meaning instead of shutting, it opens up backwards into the ventricle, what happens is you're seeing is a rush of blood coming back, which is why it's, you know, it's, it's high pitch over here, and then, excuse me, not high pitch, but there's higher volume here, which decreases as the ventricle fills up and increases in pressure. This drops off and becomes less and less. So it's a diastolic sound as it's filling back up into the ventricle, um, or, or excuse me, a decrescendo sound as it's filling up that ventricle. If it's mid to late, so you notice here we have an OS, which is an opening snap. So this bar indicates an opening snap. This is classic by mitral or tricuspid stenosis. So during diastole, remember, those valves are supposed to open up. If they're rigid, they don't open up fully, you might get a bit of an opening snap type sound. And you'll notice that as the blood empties into the ventricle, you can kind of hear a decrescendo sound, similar to what we saw up here, but with less intensity. Okay, and then you'll notice at the very end of diastole, we have a crescendo sound. So there's a decrescendo and then a crescendo right before systole. And that's because the atria are contracting right before systole there. And the last one is really just an example of severe um, mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis with an opening snap. And you'll just happen to notice that the decrescendo and crescendo are a little bit more prominent and kind of run into each other. So this is actually for you guys to kind of practice. This was a, a, just a drawn up where you can see S1 and S2. So this would be between you know, during systole and then during diastole. So take a look at this. You, know, you can pause this video at this point and try to see if you can figure out. Uh, it's not a perfect drawing, but you can kind of, kind of figure it out and see if you know which one's which. All right. And those will be the answers to that. So you guys can see if you guys got it correct. And then this last um, slide. We have the dynamic auscultation maneuvers. So this is where we're positioning the patient to best be able to figure out what's actually happening, what the sound is that we're hearing. So um, the first one I actually already talked about, which is inspiration and expiration. 
simply by having them breathe in and breathe out when you tell them to. So you take a deep breath in, exhale out. Uh, what you're doing is you're changing the volumes to the heart, right? So as they in breathe in, there's an increase in blood volume to the right side of the heart. Now, the general rule is this. Uh, for most murmurs, not all, but for most, I have the, an increase in volume is going to increase the intensity of the murmur. A decrease in volume will decrease the intensity of most murmurs. So by having them breathe in, if I need to figure out what that murmur is, let's say, left side of the heart versus right side of the heart, well, if I have them breathe in, that's going to increase volume to the right side of the heart. So if the murmur is on the right side of the heart, it will increase in intensity because of the increase in volume. If, on the other hand, it's on the left side of the heart, as they breathe in, the murmur should diminish. Okay. Now, as they exhale, it would be the reverse of that. Now, I can also do a left lateral decubitus position, right, which is what you're seeing in the cartoon, or not the cartoon, excuse me, the image over here, where in this case, the uh, the physician is actually palpating the patient's chest and feeling for, you know, maybe uh, the, the point of maximal impulse and what have you. Uh, but you can also put them in that position and listen. And in that position, it's really good for hearing uh, low intensity murmurs of an S3 or an S4. Okay. Remember, an S3 would be a large ventricular chamber, and an S4 would be more of a, like a stiff, rigid chamber. All right. So using the um, the bell of the stethoscope. The Valsalva, Valsalva maneuver is bearing down, right? They hold their breath and they bear down, all right? So the Valsalva actually decreases what we call preload or decreases volume return to the heart as a whole, because you're basically blocking blood flow back to the heart in general. Uh, so it decreases right side and left side simply because you're cutting off or reducing the amount of fl blood flow. And so again, this will be a maneuver you can make to, to discern uh, or amplify or reduce the intensity of certain murmurs. Uh, standing, you have the patient stand up abruptly and what that does is that decreases the, the volume uh, to the heart. Squatting, squatting would increase volume to the heart. So as you squat, you increase you know, the venous return, you increase volume to the heart. Um, it also increases afterload and if you call afterload, it's the pressure that the heart has to overcome on the left side of the heart there. Um, and as well as on the right side, but during this maneuver, really what's going to affect is the left side of the heart. Increasing afterload because what happens is you squat and you bend your knees and you bend at the hips, you're kinking a lot of uh, arteries and it increases resistance. And that can actually act as increase in resistance that the left ventricle has to overcome. So, um, you know, we can do that uh, as well with a hand grip. So hand grip exercises are going to increase afterload. In other words, you have the patient squeeze their hand tightly and hold it there for a little while and then let go and then do it again, squeeze and hold. What that's doing is, is it's increasing afterload and increasing pressure that the left side of the heart has to overcome. So just to kind of point out, what would increasing afterload help us with? So, for example, it would increase the intensity of uh, regurgitation maneuver, uh, murmurs. So if somebody has, let's say, mitral regurg, if they increase the afterload, less of the blood is going to be going into the aorta and it's going to be shunted, even more of it's going to be shunted backwards uh, or moved backwards into the left atrium. And then that increase in volume increases the murmur. It works the same way with the uh, ventricular septal defect. Blood normally would go from the high pressure left ventricle into the right, uh, right ventricle. If you increase the afterload by, say, a hand grip test, that's going to decrease the amount of blood that ejects from the ventricle and more of it's going to move into the right side of the heart, thus increasing the sound of the murmur. Uh, on the other hand, if you have something like aortic stenosis, uh, a hand grip might actually reduce the sound of an aortic stenosis by further reduce or increasing the afterload on the ventricle. So these are maneuvers that are going to help us to figure out what's going on. Uh, blood pressure cuff. You could increase uh, the blood pressure cuff. You inflate the blood pressure cuff and it squeezes the arm. When it squeezes the arm, that can kink blood vessels and increase afterload. You could raise the leg of the patients uh, as they're lying down and that would increase venous return to the heart. Basically the idea is we're, we're manipulating uh, volumes and we're uh, preloads and afterloads to see if we can manipulate the way the heart sounds um, either increase or decrease in intensity. And the idea is that to help us to kind of figure out and isolate what, what it is that we're hearing. 
And, you know, we wouldn't necessarily do all of these on a, on a particular patient. It depends on the patient. You know, we might get enough information just from doing the breathing, right? Uh, but, you know, maybe we can't, uh, maybe the person doesn't move very well, so they can't really stand. So raising their leg might be a better option. Um, they may be very weak and not be able to do much of a hand grip, so I can, you know, uh, I can use the blood pressure cuff maneuver. So this would be really at your sort of the discretion and, and on an individual basis how you would approach this. Okay, so I hope it helps us with this, uh, with the heart sounds. Uh, make sure to review this, but then check out the next video, which will be on valvular disorders, which there obviously a lot of them are, are diagnosed just simply by uh, auscultating. And um, so it'll make understanding, you know, the physical exam, especially with valvular disorders, uh, a lot clearer. So make sure you watch this and then follow it up with that video. Okay.